Hey, welcome back. How's everybody? Good. So you, uh, thank you. Uh, two people submitted their assignment to Blackboard, and uh, well, not to Blackboard. They emailed it to me, but I give you guys an assignment. Basically, do something with App Engine and Data Store. And uh, Corey turned in something that's pretty cool. You guys want to see it? Right, yeah, sorry, I just, like, they emailed me, like, at midnight last night, same thing, and I was like, sorry, and I put it up on Blackboard, so you can now submit it to Blackboard, but, like, uh, here's Corey's, you know, so you could add a show if you want, somebody give me the name of some show, because I'm completely out of pop culture, what, it? Scarface, that's what I heard, I don't know what you said. Add it. Oh, cool. That show's now up there. And then you can vote. Right? Already has a vote since I added it. It won't let me vote again. You can only vote for something once. Nice. I think you need to put together the online voting system for the American political process. You got one email, you get one vote. Anyhow, that's it. So you can go into showvotingappspot.com and vote. If you got your online thing, go to show voting .appspot Dot com, and I will come back and look at this in a moment to see who voted for it. And he has really nice code. So there's his code if you want to go to that URL. And you can take a look at how he put his code together. So we'll come back to that in a second and see who voted. Somebody else submitted too, but who else submitted? Somebody else emailed me. Are you here? Cool. What was your your email? Uh, Benavides underscore zero five four. My present state email. How do you spell that? The B E N A. B E N A. There we go. That was a. No, that's not it. I don't know where it went. Anyhow. Uh, we'll look at more of those later. So uh, today, this is what I want to show you. Uh, oh, next thing, if you uh, haven't had a chance to look, oh, I, I emailed a couple of you that like uh, this book's great. I showed you this book before, but there's a free chapter now, so you can read chapter one and the introduction for this book. And uh, the way you get there is uh, trying to remember where did I see that. I think if we go to, uh, well, I'll tweet it on my Twitter account. So um, uh, to get to that, sent mail, like sharing my entire life with people. This is great. Copy that. The trick is no matter how much you try, anyone can get a very good amount of information about you either way. Even having a photo out there, do a reverse image search and find everything. That's how I do that, right? Pound go lane. So there you go. So now you can get to that book, All right? Twitter at Todd underscore McLeod. I never, I think like I'm a little bit too old, like I never fully embraced Twitter. Just got a little bit missed by Facebook. I used to have a MySpace account. How many people in here had a MySpace account? Not that many, huh? All right. So that, that book's there. Let's see how many people have voted. Parks and Recreation's doing well. Six Feet Under. Who else voted for Six Feet Under? Nobody. It's a glitch. <laughs> it's an accidental vote. It's a great show if you've never watched Six Feet Under. Well, it's hard to view it because, you know, I'll put something up and then I can't vote for it. Uh, I can't run a Google account. Mm. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, man. I liked it. All right. So, uh, this is the next thing. 5502. And uh, we're going off the 
slideshow presentations and just go into looking at code. Find myself transitioning from slideshows. Localhost 8080. Firing up. You are now fired up. Waha! Sign in as administrator. Now I'll just sign in as a normal person, log in. To do! What is there to do? Who has something to do? Go over to Comp Sci Office and sign paperwork. Does not to do? Get wrapped and ticket from Comp Sci Office. Really? For what? Your science uh, club is doing some sort of thing on Thursday morning. Who else has a to do? <laughs> and done. 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 More. Okay, cool. You guys see what it's doing? It doesn't organize on spelling or No, I didn't do any sorting. Okay, so just what it what the database or net store gives it to you as well. Yeah. I don't think I did sorting. Just go to class jump right up on top and that was kind of We could improve it. <laughs> so uh, to build this, it gets kind of like the uh, Reddit post thing we did, where you put a post into the down store and then bring it back based on the email or username, whatever we did. I was looking at the, at the structure. Yeah. I'm not recollecting that, but okay. We did it last semester. Oh, last semester. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here is a struct, and I'm storing ID, email, and text. And this syntax right here, you could add fields to structs when you're going to pass them, or you could add tags. Sorry, they're called tags. You could add tags to structs when you're going to pass them to the data store, and that'll give the data store additional information. So you can learn about that at uh, Golang App Engine and Data Store and Reference and Tags. Let's see, are those the tags? Yeah. So uh, you know this tag right here, I is ignored entirely by the Data Store when you add that. So that's not going to go into the data store, totally ignored by the data store. So we are ignoring ID. Why would we have ID here if we're just going to ignore it? Uh, ID is here so we could pass it probably to our index and use it on our template in fields, right? But, uh, you know, we'll be getting the ID maybe probably from data store when we want to use it for interacting with the data store. Or maybe it's here so we could use it to interact with the data store, pass something back, delete something, I don't know. But we don't want to pass this back to the data store. We'll do the key, new key thing, right? And, uh, and then here are my routes. So handle index goes to here. So if it's not, if it's anything other than to do, because anything that comes in to do will be handled there. Anything that comes in at assets, right? We're serving, you know, files. So all the files here at assets, any files under here just automatically get served. So if it comes in at this, anything there or lower. I don't know if I need that. All I've got a, is a index HTML, but we'll see. And then, so anything else not found. So if I was to go to, and it's not running anymore. Local state 80, cowboy. 
not found. Right? Because this, there's no more specific. There's no more specific path that matches that. And so it gets caught there. And if it's uh, not equal to just the slash when you're at this handler, handler funk, then uh, it's not found. So here we're going to HP serve files, and we're just serving, we're serving that. So I'm kind of run, wondering if this is redundant. So I'm going to take this line out for a second and see what happens. So if I just go here to index, what happens? Looks fine. So I don't really have any, any assets to serve there, so I could take that out because that's serving the file, that one file. So it's kind of, go ahead. You don't even need to go through, uh, oh, you're just using the serve file. Yeah, yeah right. serve file versus file server. Yes, yeah. So then when a to-do comes in, we run handle to-dos, and we get the new context, and then pull the user out of the context, and we're gonna make a slice of to-dos. What's that zero do? Hmm? Yeah, so when you have a make on a slice, you could do, uh, you could give it the length and capacity. So I could also do like that, and this would be the length, and this would be the capacity. And uh, if it's just this, then the length and capacity are both zero. And why, what would this say right here? Like if I had it like that, what's that saying? Your slice would be 10 large, but the underlying array would be 100. Yeah, so the underlying array is 100. Why would I want to do this? Why? Yeah, yeah, so if I want to expand it later, it's more performant to already have the underlying array have the capacity so I don't have to continually recreate arrays, right? Like if I had zero, well, if they're both zero, as soon as I create one, right, then my array has to be go from zero to one, right? And then as I create two, I have to create a whole new underlying array, right? And then as I create three, I have to create a whole new underlying array, which is now size capacity four, Right? And, uh, and then if I do four, I already have that array. And then if I do five, my array goes to eight. Right? So I'm just having to recreate arrays, arrays, arrays. So if I know, like, hey, there's a certain amount I want to store, then I'm just going to make my capacity 100 and start out with my length of zero. Um, so uh, I'm kind of curious, though, like, if uh, just with slices, just kind of like revisiting, you know, some of the stuff. But with slices, if this is, like, set to... 10, 0, then is that a, a nil, sli nil slice, nil slice, or, you know, if this is set to 10, and that's 100, you know, what does 11 look like versus 10? Like, is 10 initialized to the 0 value, and 11 is just nil for the slice? I don't know. Kind of interesting to think about. There's room to experiment there still and learn for me. you have any insight into that? I think it makes the entire array zero, filled with zero values. But then uh, the bounds checking on the uh, slice will prevent you from going outside of its uh, length. So there's that. Create slices, maps, and channels only. Returns an initialized, not zeroed, value of type T. Make T args. The reason for, so it's initialized, not zero value. The reason for the distinction is that these three types represent under the covers references data structures. It must be initialized before use. So slice, for example, is a three item descriptor containing a pointer to the data uh, inside an array, the length and the capacity. And until those items are initialized, the slice is nil. Right? Uh, so it initializes the values. For slices, maps, and channels, make initialize the internal data structure and prepares value for use. Yeah, I'd have to actually reference it to it. So a slice is basically similar to a struct. It's got a pointer and two ints. The pointer points to somewhere in an array, which is the first item. 
it's got the slice, the size, which is how much this slice is holding, and then it's got capacity, which is how much space from the pointer till the end of the array. Interesting. Still wrapping my head around the differences between that. Like, okay, well, if it's initialized, what's it initialized to? If it's initialized to, uh, and it's not the zero value, if it's initialized, this is a slice of to-dos. So we're going to have to-dos in here. If the to-dos are initialized, the to-dos are zero. Initialized to their zero value? <laughs> so the to-dos are zero value. It's saying okay. the slice is initialized. The slice is initialized. So it's just ready to use. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's got an actual memory address and the size and capacity is not just... The, the, the zero value of a slice would be nil. Yeah. Yeah, so this is initialized or ready to use. It's not yeah. nil. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, now if uh, we have a git come in, so switching on our method, our request method, and if it's git, we're going to... Maybe, yeah, I guess we'll do that. Data store new query to do is our kind. And then we're filtering by email and we're getting email from uh, the context, user context. And then we're doing an iterator run over our, our query and it takes the context. And so we're looping over that. And we create a uh, instance, we create a variable to do of type to do. And what does this do here? Is that initialize or zero value? Zero value. So what's the zero value of uh, type to do? Zero, empty string, empty string. Okay, so that's what the zero value of that would be. And then uh, we get the next item, right? So item zero, item one, item two. We put that data into the variable to do of type to do. And uh, that will give us a key and an error. If the data store is done, we break, so we'll leave this loop. If the error is not nil, right, if some other error, then error retrieving to do's, and we could write back the error to the client and return. Some people say don't send error information to the client because then that gives them you know, just that much more information to hack your system. Aha, you're on App Engine and Data Store. Now I know what I could use to try to get into you, right? You just gave them a little bit more information where your app is running. And so you might encrypt this error, Caleb said. And, uh, and that way, if the client gets an error and they take a screenshot and send it to you, great. You know, you see it, but, and you'll be able to decrypt it, but the client doesn't know you're on App Engine. Uh, just a little thought. You got any thoughts on that? I, I think usually, splitting hairs. Yeah, I think I would usually just say server error. You've got your error yourself because of your log statement there. Yeah, you can look at that in the uh, Google, uh, the, the console, the developer console. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's this error app that will have a nice red exclamation mark next to it to point you out this is from an error, not just a normal log message. Yeah. And then we get the ID from the key. So that's the function which is available to return that. We assign it to our uh, struct. And, uh, and then we append, am I saying that right, that this would be a struct? Is to do a struct, or it's a variable of type struct? It's a variable, yeah, variable of struct. type struct. And then we, uh, so we assign it, and then we append to our slices the to do. So what is it that is getting appended here to the slices? What are, what, what are the slices? It's a, it's a list of to-dos, right? All the different to-dos. So we're getting all the different to-dos and we're putting them in here. And all the to-dos that we're putting in are in this, you know, uh, are of type to-do struct. I think the to-dos is the, uh, the bunch of them and then the single to-do is what you're adding on to Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but thank you. I totally appreciate you, th you contributing. I didn't mean that to be like, yeah, yeah, discounting. Uh, and then we're going to do, what's this line doing and why is it here? What's that tell you? Yeah, yeah, so we're encoding it to JSON and what's happening with that encoding? Yeah, we're sending it to the response. Why uh, new encoder versus Marshall? Yeah, yeah. 
So when we want to do uh, JSON encoding, we got two choices. We got encode, decode, new encoder, encode, right? Or uh, new decoder, decode, right here, right? And we have marshaling and unmarshaling. And so we use new encoder, encode, and uh, new decoder, decode when we're wanting to get it from a stream or write it back to a stream. And just tell me if I'm not saying that right. <laughs> And, uh, and then we use Marshall on Marshall, kind of like when we just want to do string print, right? Like, just give it to me right here in my program, I'm going to deal with it, and then I can take that and send it off somewhere else, right? And so new encoder, we're writing this back to the response, and we're encoding all of all that <coughs> stuff. I haven't heard the magic word. What's, I'm sending back JSON to where? To the client, right? The person who asked for it, which means what? that on my HTML page, what is running? Like if they're going to receive JSON, they got to catch it and do something with it. What's catching it? JavaScript Ajax. JavaScript Ajax, thank you. That was the word. So if, when we go look at the HTML file, we'll see the JavaScript and Ajax. So we're sending back just JSON, right? And if there's an error, then, you know, uh, we put it. So here's the post. Uh, again, creating a variable to do of type to do struct. I don't know how to say some of this stuff sometimes. <laughs> and then, uh, what's this one doing? I know it's the exact opposite, but tell me, tell me, read it back to me, somebody. Like, oh, this is what's happening. Explain the process of that line. So this one, the request that's coming in has a JSON object, and you're trying to yeah. it in your object. So the request that's coming in, right? The client sent me some stuff, and they sent me some JSON. And so I'm, I'm catching that here with new decoder, request body, and I'm decoding that, and I'm sticking it into the to-do, right? So the client is sending me another to-do, and it's, it's, uh, it's JSON, okay? And so now that's in to-do. If there's an error, I, I catch the error, deal with the error, and then I get the email from uh, the context, from that, and that's where I sign email. Why would I not want to get the email just straight from the request body? Dude, the user could send me anybody's email, and then they could be posting to do's at somebody else, giving somebody else to do's, right? So you build it like this, your wife's going to have a harder time giving you to do's. <laughs> right? You can only give yourself to do's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there we go, right? So that's where we get the email, and then we create a new incomplete key. What's the difference between incomplete key and new key? I know, review, but somebody just say it. Um, for incomplete key, you don't have to give it your own key. It'll generate one. Yeah, so incomplete key is it's incomplete. I haven't gotten a key yet. I'm saying to App Engine, you make the key. Right? If it's just new key, cool, the key's done, and it's either the ID is either string or it's an int. Right? And I've chosen which one, and this is what the key is, right? But here it's incomplete, App Engine's gonna make up the ID for me. And it'll be a new numeric int random number. I think it also puts a guarantee that it won't be uh, colliding too. Mm -hmm. So it may pick a random number, but then it'll also check, hey, is this random number I already exist? If so, let's pick another random number. Yeah, <clears throat> that's absolutely true. So then uh, we're going to put to the data store this new to-do. The client said, hey, here's another to-do I want. So now we're, we've taken that and we've, uh, you know, decoded it. And now we've got a key. Now we're going to put it to the data store. So context, key, to-do. And that's the kind. So that's basically AKA EG the table, right? Someday, I hope, someday and I hope that day is soon, it'll be more familiar to me to talk about NoSQL than SQL, <laughs> schema-less than schema, but kind. I was feeling it a little bit there, like, that's oh, the kind. All right, and then we get the ID, and we store that in here. So the key, right, we get that ID, and we store it in our to-do, and uh, we're going to send back to the client. So that's the one where, like, we're just, you know, before we told them, just ignore this. Well, here we're starting to use that. We're sending the key back to the client. And so here we're sending back to the client the to-do. And then the client's going to catch up with Ajax and add it to the list. And then to delete, 
request form value ID. So with delete, right, if case is delete, uh, looks like a, I want to say a form was submitted, but just another request was made to the server with uh, the HTTP verb of delete. They're called verbs, they're also called what? Method, HTTP method, that's the better word. Which is the better word? I think Caleb used method, right? Yeah, I think, I think he used method. I've heard used as method quite a lot. Yeah, method's probably better. So request, form value, uh, ID. And so the ID is coming back when we want to delete something. So somebody could delete your to-dos if they could guess the ID and send it in. Considering it's a 64-bit long uh, random number, it's unlikely. Yeah. It's like four billion squared possibilities. Good luck guessing someone's uh, ID there. So let's take a look at parse int here for a second. Parse int takes a string, a base int, so it's base 10, and then a bit size, 64. So why, uh, why are we using parse int? And I'm, I'm thinking Daniel might be able to answer this. Why are we using parse int here versus uh, I to A? No, A to I. Why parse int versus A to I? Because A to I takes ASCII and turns it into an int. Because why? It could be a two-digit number. Isn't the, the I to A only for a single character? Yeah. Also, it could not be. No, A, a to I takes in a string. Um, oh. No, the it's speed. Uh, well, I think A to I may also be a 32-bit only. I'm not sure. Um, but A to I takes asking, turns it into an int. I don't have the answer. I was just like, I remember we talked about it at a A to I parse int. You want to see parse int first? It's got a long explanation. Yeah, ready to read A to I? Shorthand for parse int S10. Interesting. <laughs> so 10 zero, 0 would have been octal. Is that right? No, no wait. That, that's that's the base. The bit size. Yeah. Bit size is 0. And then zero, if my machine was a 32-bit, it would have been in 32. And we're wanting 64. So parse int's a little bit more specific. Kind of fun, or interesting. Somewhere between fun and interesting. A little bit of both. So uh, we get our ID, and then new, new, uh, new key. And, and so we could create the whole key right here. And then we have the key. And then data store get, and we could get the item and put it in here and then uh, if to do email is not equal to you email right so we're just checking so nobody you else know, you can. can't just guess the random there number. you go can't just guess it and then then we delete it so the entire reason we did all this right here was just authenticating right we could have just uh, well we could have just done that right there got the key and then delete it and this was authenticating that the person trying to delete is actually the person who has uh, the authority to delete it. And then just one default down there, method not allowed. So that new key means a new key. No, new key is a new key. We, we don't need App Engine to give us anything, right? Because we have context, the kind, and this could either be, if it was a string of a key, like email, then that would go there and this would be zero. But since we have a numeric ID that came back from App Engine, we put that right here, and this is just you know an empty string, zero value, and then nil here. The nil is for ancestors, and we don't have any, so that actually creates the key right there. 
an incomplete key, we need to pass it to App Engine, and then they'll finish it off for us, right? But we got the key now, so now we could use it down here to access the, the item. You're not allowed to use an incomplete key for uh, get and delete because those are looking at the App Engine for stuff. Incomplete key is for I don't have an ID, but I'm creating this data that I need to put in here. Here's the data. Here's an incomplete key. Finish off the key for me as you're putting it in. Yeah. Well said. So uh, just looking at the JavaScript, a little styling up here at the top. So I'm using Flexbox. And uh, the best place to learn about Flexbox or use Flexbox is... I got a tweet. One. What's that mean? Where did I click? I go here. Somebody tweet me or is it me? I don't know what one means. It's gone. <laughs> what is I going to go look at? Flexbox. CSS tricks. So uh, CSS tricks right here, Flexbox. So Flexbox lets you do layout. And the thing that you just have to think about is when you apply Flexbox, like if I applied Flexbox to article, then the, the, the tags that it's going to impact right, are its direct children. So it'll impact this one, this one, this one, and that's it. Right? So it'll impact that one, that one, and that one. So these are the children if I just apply it right to article. And then I could say, hey, I want these to be arranged in a row or in a column. And I want to, you know, uh, justify content like center or whatever, or I want to vertically line at center. And so you just apply, make this a flex container, and then you're applying stuff to uh, the children, how you want them laid out, okay? So you'll, like, maybe apply Flexbox. I'll apply Flexbox to this and make it a column, apply Flexbox to this, make it a row, apply Flexbox to this, make it a column, and that's how I'm, like, laying things out in rows and columns and distributing the space between them. And so that's all explained here, right? So you take whatever you want, you know, whatever thing is the container, and you say, hey, flex, and then you set the direction, column or row, and you could do row reverse or column reverse, and you, then you could set wrapping, default is no wrap, if you want it to wrap, you could do that. And, uh, and this is shorthand for flex direction and flex wrap, and then you could do justify content, Right, where you can line things to the left or the right or the center or space between, which is cool. And then you could do align items, top, bottom, center, stretch, baseline. Okay. And when you go from row, this is this is for row, justify content and align items. Is this is they work like this for a row. When you go to column, right, it flips. And so the column, this is justify content for a column becomes the vertical. So it's as if you took your computer and you went like that, right? You're now looking at, uh, like, you know, put everything at the top, put everything at the bottom, put everything in the vertical center. That's for a column. And, and then here it'd be put everything over on the left side of the column, put everything over on the right side of the column, put everything in the center of the column. column. So there's just a little bit of a flip there when you go from row to column, how line items and justify content, they basically... You know, you just got to kind of wrap your head around it. And they call that like the primary axis or something. You got to think about the cross axis and the primary axis. But that's like the basics of Flexbox. So that's, uh, that's all the styling up there. And here's the HTML to do. And then I just create a div with items, right? So I'm going to target that in my JavaScript and put my items in there, create my items, put them in there. And then there's a section here. And, you know, I said, well, no, it's not a form submission. It's just a request coming back with a HTTP method of delete, right? Because here is uh, where I put my input type. Well, actually, that, 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 that's going to be up there, the ones for delete. Sorry. And then here, here's where I'm able to input stuff. But you can see there's no form there. Even though I'm using input, there's no form. I'm not submitting a form. I'm just telling programmatically through JavaScript, now make this, you know, send this to the server with this method. Did I confuse you? No. So we'll get a, uh, to do this, a slice of current items. So I create a, uh, I create a variable called current items and set it equal to a slice. 
in JavaScript, it's all just arrays. An array. I, I, think, I, think I like calling lists. it a slice. <laughs> a list. I think it's, I don't know what you call it. Yeah. Looks like the same thing. A list. And then this stuff is just getting, uh, getting items right there, ID items, getting new item right here, new item, and getting article, which is right here. And that way, programmatically, I'm now going to be able to reference those different pieces in my DOM, document object model. Why do we call it the DOM? Because it's a model of the objects in my document. I think we should have maybe called it mod. <laughs> document object model, right? It's a model of the objects in my document. I think it makes more sense when you go backwards. <laughs> you know? Plus, mod's kind of cool. It's like the thing from the 70s. So now I have a, a function here, get items, and as soon as I define the function, I run it. And so it's a new uh, AJAX, right? XML HTTP request. And then I open it, and it's a get to that path. Right, so you know, and the to do path over in my code was uh, this one handle to do's, right? To do goes to handle to do's, and then get means it's going to run all that, which is going to do the new encoder and code and send back, you know, a bunch of JSON. And the JSON that it's sending back is uh, the slice of to do's, right? That's what is getting sent over the slice of to do's. And then send, why is that null? If that wasn't null, what would be there, and how would this have to change? What do you use this for, and why does that have to change when you use it? Generally speaking, to be, you know, do things correctly. So let me give you an example. That's where you put your data, right? When you're sending something from a client through uh, uh, Ajax, right? That's where you put your data, sending your JSON back. And so it's post, right? Hey, I'm posting this to the server. Do something with it. So here, we're just asking for stuff. We're not sending stuff, right? So hey, get it. Get it for me. And I'm not sending you anything, so that's null. Yeah? <coughs> Why null there? Why not just like that? Oh, you got to This is just how Ajax works. Those three lines right there, and this, right? So you say, "Hey, new uh, XML HTTP request," and I'm going to open that, and I'm going to send it. So it's sent. Now I'm listening for you know uh, changes to that you know object, right? And uh, and when I get a change, we're going to run this function. And if the change, the ready state, is equal to four, which is like the last one, then cool, you're done. And now I'm going to do this, right? And, uh, and we're going to parse, JSON parse, the response text. So the response is what comes back with Ajax. So parse that, and that gives me current items, which goes in there, which is a, is a list of to-dos. So this wouldn't work if you uh, comment? Yeah, if you, if you get rid of the send thing, then it's it's not going to send the data. But you, it's created the request there. Hey, give me the stuff, but then it has never sent it over to the server to respond. To it. I don't know if that's like always open or what, right? Like open if it just like open some. Why didn't I close it? I don't know. Yeah, the open is kind of an odd naming scheme, but they're both open and send are both required. Yeah, I can see how it seems a little bit redundant. And then I run render items once I get all that. So render items, what does render items do? Right, I'm going to uh, create the HTML. And so items.enterHTML is equal to nothing. What was items? Items is this, items is that, right? Items selected this. So I want to create the enter HTML of that. If there's already enter HTML, which is that stuff right here, right? If there's already enter HTML, get rid of it. 
So we're going to wipe the slate clean and refill it back up. So we're not continually adding to stuff that's already there. And you can use enter HTML or what's the other one? Do you remember? I can't remember. Um, There's like text a, content. Something like that. But that doesn't affect HTML wow. nodes. But there's there's another one you could use, and there's some distinction about which one's better where and when. But I can't remember it. Yeah, something like that. So inner HTML is better if you need to change a whole bunch of HTML all at once, and it's also extremely convenient for clearing out the uh, contents like like it's being done here. So we get uh, inner HTML, and this is what we're going to create inside that div. That's the structure. We're going to have a section with two children, an H2 and an anchor. And then the anchor is going to have a child, which is an I. And I comes from uh, Font Awesome. So Font Awesome gives you icons, right, that you can use. And so that was the little plus or minus icon, OK? So I originally, when the web first came out, stood for italics. Still does. It still does, yes, by default. So, but HTML5 said they want better, uh, more semantic meanings. So instead, in HTML5, they've got new tags that give you italics and bold and such. And so the old B and I tags, though, are kind of sticking around for backwards compatibility. But they've been repurposed by some things, like Font Awesome repurposes the I tag for its own icons. Hmm. So now we uh, are looping through all of our current items, which is that list. Da -da, of our objects, which we got back. And so for each one, we're going to create this. And uh, we uh, create, first of all, create element, create element, create element, create element. So creating our section, creating our H2, creating our anchor, creating our icon. Section, H2, anchor, icon. So we just bam, 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 bam create four DOM elements, okay? And then for H2, we're saying text content is current items, right? Access that item, give me the text, right? So text was right here. So give me the text. Uh, set that to the H2, the text content. Maybe that's the one I was thinking of, text content instead of inner HTML. So the reason to use text content instead of inner HTML is that text content will escape all the HTML put into it appropriately. That's so you don't have to worry about uh, anyone putting in a, a script tag in their uh, to-do list and executing it on themselves. Awesome. Since we're not using templates from Go, we have to protect ourselves in another way. Don't pawn me. I don't want to be pawned. <laughs> and then we have uh, anchor set attribute, href just pound. Go pound sand. Sends it to nowhere. I think anchor tags have got just an anchor uh, href uh, member variable too. You can just say a.href equals pound. Oh really? All right. Many ways to skin a cat. Yeah. Yep, and yep. boy, do they yowl. No matter how you do it. Sorry, dark humor. Um, what? Uh, why? Why is that there? Why even put that in there? If I'm doing an anchor and saying click to nowhere, why put that in? Yeah, but why not just have the I? I have this. It's going nowhere. Why? Why have that? Are we doing something else with it? Because that makes this clickable. Yeah, we we'll make it click. Yeah, so that makes it clickable. I guess I could have made this right here just said clickable yeah, you, somehow, you, right? You can add an, a non-click event listener to any item, um, but anchor tags have got by default the bunch of CSS for like you're changing your pointer to a uh, pointer thing and such. And then icon set attribute class ID right so I'm giving it a class 
I'm giving it an ID, which is that current one. So when it gets clicked, I could grab that ID and send it back. That's the one we want to delete. And this is the minus circle. So that's where you get the, the delete this, the red, you know, thing. It's no longer up. But I'm still running. That's that. And if we look at the structure of this page, you know, we create a section, created two children, H2 and an anchor. And then we have an I, a, under the anchor is a child, it's an I. And there's our ID, right? And that's the minus circle. So we set that class and we set that ID. And now when somebody clicks this, we could grab the ID and pass it back. This is the one I want to delete. So that's where we're setting that class and the ID. And then we uh, do these append childs. So to the section, I'm appending H2. Right? So section, append H2. And then the anchor, I'm appending the icon anchor appending the icon and then the section I'm appending the anchor section append anchor and then the items I'm appending uh, the section so this whole section so the items was items 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 right and I do that for every object I create all that that's pretty cool what's the downside of this just from the high level perspective, what's the downside of Ajax? It's JavaScript, right? And JavaScript is more difficult for search engines to understand. So they look at your page, they're like, I don't know. Right? As opposed to if it's just like hard coded back from the server, here it is. Okay, cool. You know? Um, and then also JavaScript uh, has, uh, from a, the AMP perspective, the accelerated mobile pages, that new thing Google's doing, JavaScript's like, uh, not, not the best. I don't fully understand that, but the, like JavaScript's down on the bottom. They don't like client-side code running. They just want, here's your finished page, right? So old school, pre-Ajax. So it's slower and it is more insecure too. You are actually executing code on your web browser. It's pretty easy to create a JavaScript thing that's a virus and then make your website and give it out to everyone. And what's the plus side of Ajax? I don't have to send the entire, I don't have to do a full page reload, right? They're looking at their page and then it just grows, right? It's more of a sort of native application experience. It's not like, gone, here's the new page. Right? It's just data got added. Just don't go overboard, then you get Blackboard. <laughs> Does Blackboard a lot of Ajax? It's really slow. It's, I think it uses iframes more than Ajax, though. But it's really slow. It's got a lot of JavaScript. So here, adding an event listener. So on click, I'm going to run this function. That function goes all the way to there. Right? So add events listener. What type of event? Click. Here's the function to run. And then false means something. I don't remember what. It defaults to false too. So What does false mean on add event listener? Um, I think it has to do with the order that it calls the event listener on. In JavaScript, event listeners occur on the item as well as every sub item too. Mm. Um, so I think that false or true determines which order it calls it on for each sub item. Where would I go if I wanted to look that up? What website is the best one to look at according to Todd McLeod? MDN add event. Add event listener? MDN add event listener. It's kind of hilarious. Google's got the best browser and Firefox has got the best docs. <laughs> Type listener where example. I'm just gonna search for false. So capture. type. Type listener. Use capture. Optional. 
Uh, if true, use capture indicates that the user wishes to initiate capture. After initiating capture, all events of the specified type will be dispatched to the registered listener before being dispatched to the event target beneath it in the DOM tree. Events which are bubbling upward through the tree, oh, that's right, will not trigger the listener designated to use capture for detail, if not specified use. So, yeah, there's this uh, thing about bubbling up, which I totally don't remember completely. Yeah, it's extremely fancy, you can, but you can usually just ignore it. It defaults to false, so if you skip it, it'll give you a good generic. <clears throat> so add event listener means that I'm adding this to article, and uh, article is this whole deal. So I'm now listening for a click anywhere here. If I click to do, like, oh, I've heard that click, and my code's going to run. That function's going to run. If I click one of these sections, if I click an item <clears throat> with the sections in there, anything I click, that's going to run. Well, when it runs, you can see there's, I can put in here the event. So what was it that got clicked? And then I have access to here, target ID. So like, you know, the, the thing that got clicked, the click, the target, has different properties. One of the properties is ID, right? So if the ID is equal to new, right, then, oh, okay, this is the one where, you know, you want to add a new item. So ID is new. There. Right? And this is like for, that's the plus sign to add the new item. And so if somebody clicks anything in that entire area, oh, okay, this code ran. And if it's ID is equal to new and text is equal to add item, please enter a to do item. If uh, ID is equal to new and text is not equal to add item, cool, now we're going to send that over. Right? And so we do a new, new XHTML, it's going to be a post, we're posting to this place. And we're going to stringify, turn everything into JSON. And what are we turning into JSON? This object right here. And so the other fields, if they're not there, then they just, when you uh, encode, decode, or mar yeah, encode, decode, or marshal, unmarshal, whatever, right? On the other side here, right, all we are sending over is text. These will just be set to what? Nothing? They just get ignored, right? Yeah. There's, they're their original zero initialized, because this, this is initialized, so it's their zero value, right? Yeah. It's all right. Initialize your value. And then we send over that data and we do on ready state change and uh, this thing. And so when we get a response back, so we sent the data over and that is going to run to do. And to do is handle to do's. And we did get, we did post, right? Here we did post. And so with the post, we receive that, we catch it, new encoder, request body, catch it, decode it, put it in here, right? And then we uh, put it into the data store, and then we get the ID <coughs> back from the data store, and, and we grab the ID and put it onto the to-do, so we just filled in this part, right? And, uh, and then now that we have that part filled in, we're going to encode that uh, and then send it back to the client. And we send it back to the client, and so right here, when okay, here it is, it's come back, ready states four. We're going to parse that, right, get it back into an item, and then current items push. We're going to add it to our list, or whatever the heck you call it in JavaScript. And, uh, and then we're going to render items again, and when we render items once more, it's going to run all that. So it's going to wipe out all the to-dos that are there, and then rebuild them all, and put them back all on the page. Cool. And then the last thing here is just delete. And this is an anonymous self-executing function. So here's the anonymous part. It has no name. Right? And that goes all the way to here. And we just put that in parens to sort of like contain it. And we said execute it. So it's kind of a funny looking syntax. How many people when you look at that, it's like kind of funny? Raise your hand. You know, how many people you look at that and like, oh, I'm totally familiar with that kind of stuff. Raise your hand. How many people are just like not listening? Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so, right, uh, we're adding our event listener. Click, and uh, the function goes from here to here. And, uh, and we do the event. I called it event here instead of E. Whatever, could have called it E because uh, those would have different scopes, right? 
But uh, up here I called it E. So no big deal. Call it whatever you want. And uh, event target ID, give me the ID. And then this one is uh, items. I'm adding it to items. So items is that is this, right? So anything that gets clicked in my to-dos. So basically I'm looking for that minus sign being clicked, right? And I get the ID out of it. And then do, uh, I probably should do some checking because I could click the name too. But item, item, item. Where's the ID? So the ID is, so I could click H2 and not get the ID, right? So that's a little bit of a something I, I could fix up right there. Right, I could click right here and my event listener got fired but I'm not getting the ID, so it's not passing anything over that my code could do anything with. Is that right? Yeah. So I should probably do some checking, kind of like I did up here. Yeah, yeah, because it's sending the thing over. Yeah. It just doesn't have any ID. Yeah. So it's probably throwing errors on the go side. So I add the ID as a URL parameter. And pass it over as delete. And uh, not sending any data because it's just going to be right there. So how do I get that back out? Request form value ID, right? Because form value, we saw this earlier, would get it from either the form or the URL. And then send nothing. And then on race state change, if it's equal to four. Uh, set timeout, get items, 100. Why set timeout for 100? Uh, what are those, nanoseconds, milliseconds? Millis 100 milliseconds. Why set, yeah, nanoseconds? Which I want to totally find a listing of all those things. I was confused by that. We'll do that in a second. Well, no, let's do it right now. Nano, milli, micro, Millis, pico, nano, micro, kilo, mega, giga, tera. I, I want to see those second things. It looks like this is a good image. So nano, milla, centi, deci. Okay, cool. Micro, nano, pico, femto, atto, zepto, yocto. Really, really tiny with yocto. I think we need to create a search engine called zepto. Because <laughs> goog, goog is way up here, right? It's yeah. even off, farther off. Yocto is like okay. 10 to the or something is Google. Addo. We could do Addo Boy. Sorry, we don't have all the results. We only have this many results. <laughs> A quintillion of the result. Interesting. So why set timeout? Before running get items. What's get items do? Get items is this. So we get all the items, then we render the items. So why, why setting a timeout before getting all the items and running them of 100 milliseconds? Um, eventual consistency. And this is like a horrible, not, this is a hacky way to do it, right? But data store, put that data or deleted that data, right? I don't know if I need that there. Seems like I did when I built it. Yeah, you would need it. So this would be a case where memcache would probably make your program better. Um, if you had a memcache copy of all this stuff too, um, you could be deleting it from the data store and the memcache, and then have the get items check the memcache first. And memcache is immediately consistent. So whereas the uh, data store takes maybe a second or so before it actually gets all the results. You're awesome, dude. Correct. So this would be a case where memcache would make your program better. Um, although it's a lot of extra code to make that work. So uh, how many people appreciated that walkthrough and you got something good out of it? Yeah, I really appreciated uh, kind of like stepping back and saying, how can I really clean this up? Because things kind of went fast for me at, at boot camp and so I didn't get a chance to write the cleanest code. But like going through the examples we did do or the examples I didn't quite finish and figuring out what is the cleanest way I could write this code so it's the most understandable 
and taking out all the, you know, bad hacky stuff. Um, and yeah, I really, it was great for me to go through that example and do that. I would also suggest um, putting a JSON tag on the, your uh, data so it doesn't send the email back on every single um, item in your to-do list, too. Mm -hmm. Because uh, especially if you're not using HTTPS, you don't want to send mm. an email on everything. So that's just that's the same as the data store tag, just with JSON instead. Up in the go. So. Oh, up here. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing, just uh, with JSON instead of data store. So. You know that? Yep. But JSON. Yep, all lowercase. So. That way, the email that that way each individual to do list item doesn't have a copy of your email attached to it. You know your email. You're logged in with that. You don't need to have that attached to all your to do list items. And especially if you're using HTTP, which is unsecure, people can be looking and seeing. You don't want to be giving your email up uh, for free. Yeah, you want to charge them. <laughs> Has anybody figured out how to do a go font? I want to call it font. Go format. I think it's fumped, but that's the same as the fumped package. Anybody figured out how to do the go fumped with uh, recursively? Like I want to apply it to everything in this directory. Anybody figure that one out? I haven't figured that one out. There's yeah. a way to get bash to do that, but that would be a bash thing, not a go thing. Let me know if anybody figures it out. There's All right. Get bash to do everything for you. <laughs> I want to get bashed to my laundry. <laughs> Cook my dinner. 